Hi, I'm Ben Greasley, and in this video we're going to be looking at how Arnold works with lights. We're going to be looking at the default Maya lights that Arnold is able to render, and the specific Arnold lights that we have built in. We're going to be mainly looking at the Arnold menu, and how we can work with decay rates and exposures, and samples to get the best looking lights in our render. And we're going to start off by looking at a simple point light and the menus involved with that. I have a simple scene set up, it's the same scene as our previous example with a head sculpt and a backdrop. At the moment I don't have any lights in my scene at all and so I'm getting a blank render. If I go to my alpha channel we'll see it is rendering but it's just black. And I'm going to create a point light. And this is just a default Maya point light, I haven't changed anything with it. And now if I render we will see that we are getting an effect from this light, but it's very, very dark. And the reason for this is because of the decay rate. I don't see a decay rate here in my point light attributes, but if I go to my Arnold menu, which is where we're going to be spending most of our time, I can see that the decay type is set to quadratic. This is on by default because we want our lights to be physically accurate, which a quadratic decay type gives us. If I change this to a constant decay type, we'll see this appearing more like a normal light in Maya. But I'm going to change this back to quadratic because I want this to be a physically accurate light. And so I need to brighten my light up and I do this with my intensity slider. Now the intensity slider will only take us so far. I can continue increasing it and making it higher and higher. However, I can use the exposure controls within the Arnold tab from my point light. As I increase my exposure value, this is working as an f-stop value and it will increase the brightness of our light to give us something more pleasing. The other consideration we need from the top point light attribute menu is the emit diffuse and emit specular controls. And this allows us to specify if a light can interact with the diffuse contribution of a shader or the specular contribution of the shader as well. So if we have a particularly strong point light and we don't want it to give us a specular highlight, we are able to turn off the emit specular so that we just get a diffuse contribution on our shader. Outside of those main controls, all of our other considerations come from within the Arnold tab of our lights. We're going to see that most of these controls are consistent across our light types with a few exceptions, but we're going to go through these and see how they have an effect on our shot. So initially I can see I have my exposure set to around 5 and this works in conjunction with my intensity. And after that we can see I have a samples and radius control. The radius controls the actual spherical size of the light. At the moment with it set to zero, my point light is considered as a single point in space. And because of that, I can see that all of my shadows are perfectly sharp behind my object. This is very unrealistic and we very rarely get this. So I would normally have a radius for my light. And as I increase my radius, we will see that my shadow becomes more diffuse as I'm giving the light more than just a single point in space. It now occupies a volume within space. And I get a far more diffused shadow. The samples controls the amount of noise within my fall off shadow area. As we can see at the moment, this is very, very noisy around the edges where it is diffused. And as I increase my samples, this will be smoothed out. This samples value is considered in the same way as our diffuse samples within our shot. So the square of this is the number of rays fired into the scene, and that is then multiplied by the square of the anti-aliasing samples as well. So we only need to add very small increases to the number of samples here to get a much smoother result in our final render. Normalize controls the light output independent of its radius. With this function turned off, we will see that the light becomes brighter as its scale increases. As we can see, as I scale my radius down, if I make it 1, my light will become dimmer because its surface area is being reduced. We normally have normalized turned on because the radius of our light is only really used to control shadow fall off and how diffused our shadows should be, rather than light output. So as I set normalize back on, we will get a consistent light output regardless of how large my actual light source is within my scene. Cast shadows controls if we want shadows in our scene or not, and we are able to turn these off. And shadow density controls how dense these shadows should be. By default, this should be left to 1, as this is physically accurate. 
Effect volumetrics and cast volumetric shadows are dependent on volumetric fog within our scene. If I enable an environment fog from my render settings, and give it a density, we will then see that our light source appears in this volumetric. If I turn off effect volumetrics, we will see it has no effect. And cast volumetric shadows allows us to give the appearance of god rays within our scene. The bounce factor controls the relative energy lost or gained at each bounce within our scene from this light source. This should be left at 1 for physical accuracy. The number of bounces is the number of times a ray can bounce within our scene before it is discarded, though the ray limit within our render settings is still taken into account in this situation. We are now going to look at some of the other default Maya light types within our scene, and we're going to start with the directional light. And we can see that we don't need to change the intensity of our directional light as we do with other light types, because the directional light does not have a fall-off amount. It is considered a parallel light of infinite strength and size. We can see we have consistent controls for emit diffuse and emit specular, and all of the other controls we need are under the Arnold menu. As I open this menu, we can see that we get a lot of similar controls that we have before, so I can change my exposure and make it brighter or darker. Instead of a radius control, we have an angle control. And as I increase this angle, you'll see that our light becomes more diffused around the edges, yet contact shadows are still sharp. And we can see the diffused shadows are quite noisy at the moment, and so increasing the samples will fix a lot of this noise giving us a far smoother response along the diffuse shadows. You can see we're still getting some noise within the head sculpt itself and in some of the shadows, and that is because we need to increase the diffuse GI samples within our render settings. The next light type we're going to look at is the Maya Spotlight, and this light type has more controls for us to use. And again we can see that this starts off as very, very dark because the light falloff is taking into account and so I need to increase my intensity and increase my exposure as well. We can see that we have some additional controls for cone angle and this specifies how wide or tight our light cone should be. We have penumbra angle which controls the outer penumbra of our light and we have drop off which will control the intensity based on the center to the outer edge of our light as well. However, we can see by changing the penumbra angle, it has not changed the sharpness of our shadows within the scene itself. It has just changed the outer edge of it. All of those additional controls, as before, are found within the Arnold tab itself. So I can see that I have a decay type set to quadratic. I have exposure that we've seen before. I have samples. And I have radius. And as I increase this radius, we will see that, again, I get more diffuse shadows within my scene. We have cast shadow controls, we have shadow density controls, we have the same effect volumetric and cast volumetric controls. We can also see we have an aspect ratio and lens radius control as well. And the aspect ratio allows us to make our light itself more anamorphic if we choose. And the lens radius specifies how large the light source should be if we see it in the rendered camera. If I enable some volume scattering within my shot, we can see we have a light source of a single size. And if I change my lens radius, we will see that the size of the light should increase. We will see that my lens size increases dramatically. The light filters allow us to add other effects to our light sources. I have chosen to do this with the spotlight as it gives us the most options within our light filters. We're going to start off by looking at the AI light decay. And what this does is it specifies how our light should start. So it means that our start point doesn't have to be the brightest. It can start off very dark and then get brighter as it gets further away. I have set up my scene with a bit of volumetric scattering so we can see this effect. So at the moment I have my point light and my light decay isn't doing anything. So at the moment it's brightest at its source and then it falls off naturally. If I then turn on my use near attenuation and then start pulling my near start, we'll see that this can crop off where my start point is. I'm also able to use the near end control to make this far smoother in its falloff. I can also do this for my far attenuation. 
I can turn this on and I need to specify my far end first to say where the end of my light should be and then I can specify how graded or non-graded this should be. I'm now going to disconnect my light decay and we're going to look at the barn door effect. So the barn door allows us to add in traditional light setups. I'm going to have to close and restart my IPR as I've added this effect in. And as I add these, we will see that our light becomes clipped in certain directions based on our barn doors. I also have gobo effects, which are very useful for faking certain effects such as caustics. If I create my AI gobo effect and then add a slide map, Again, I will need to restart the IPR as I've made this file change. We can see we get a lighting effect based on this stenciled map which it's using. We also have the option of creating light blockers which can be used as an artificial method of masking lights in our scene without the problem of having to create additional geometry that we would need to hide. We were able to do this by going to our add filter and going to the light blocker type. And immediately we will see that it creates a cubic light blocker type. I'm then able to move this and scale it as necessary. Initially I'll see that nothing has changed because I haven't changed my density type. If I increase my density we will see that it now starts to block the light from hitting anything within this volume. So as I move the volume about this will change. You will note that this isn't affecting my indirect contribution. So the light that is bouncing off the floor and then hitting my character is still doing so. It is just my direct light contribution which is being removed. We have a few different options that we're able to use in this. I can change it to a sphere if I choose and I can see it's affecting the floor there and I can pull it into my character and have a sphere of light that isn't being affected there. I have planes and cylinder options as well. And I'm also able to ramp it so I can ramp from outskirts to the center so I can get specific shadows in certain areas that would be very hard to do if I was trying to do it with geometry. The last default Maya light type we are going to look at is the area light. As I create this, you'll see it's a standard Maya area light. And if I start my IPR, again, this will appear to be a very dark render because of the quadratic fall off we have applied. But the first thing I'm going to do with this area light is I'm going to leave its intensity where it is and I'm going to leave its exposure and I'm going to up its size and initially this won't change anything with our render it'll still say that dark our area will increase that we're working with but I'm going to turn off normalize and by doing this this will brighten our light based on its size in the case of an area light this is very useful to have it this way because most area lights would want to be used in this fashion and we can see that this is looking fairly good as area lights are a very large light type I'm getting diffused shadows anywhere I won't see any type of setting for radius involved with it but an additional tool we have here is resolution and this is used if you have a HDRI image that you want to have as your light source. So if I had a 2K square image that I was going to have in this light setup, I would have to make sure I have a 2K amount in my resolution. As this uses important sampling in the same way that the HDRI light sphere does within Arnold as well. The Arnold custom lights are available to us from the Arnold menu at the top within Maya. I'm able to go to Arnold, to my lights, and I have three different light types, and we're going to start off by looking at the area light. The area light is created by default as a cylindrical light. If I IPR render this, we'll see that it is a very dim light because of the quadratic fall off. If I scale it up, it will remain equally as dim because I have my normalize turned on. If I turn normalize off, I'll see it then brightens based on its scale. And this works in exactly the same way as the Maya area light. It has done away with a lot of the menus that we don't use when we're rendering with Arnold. But it has given us an additional option compared to the area light, and that is the light shape. You can see that we're initially working with a cylinder shape, but I am able to change this to a disc shape. I can change it to a quad shape light, and I can see it works that way. And the last option we have is a mesh light and we are able to use any type of mesh within our scene as a source for a light so I'm going to create an Arnold mesh light I'm going to start off by creating a piece of geometry in this case a torus and I'm then going to go to my Arnold menu and to my lights 
and select Mesh Light. I have to make sure that my mesh is already selected when I do this. And now I can see I get a doubling up of my mesh. And if I go to my layer system on the left hand side, I can see that I have an AI area light. And this is my mesh light. My original mesh I must keep in my scene as it is being referenced, but I can move it out of the way as I no longer need to use it. And now if I go to my IPR render, I will see that I am getting illumination from this area shape. But if I turn off, normalize, I'll see that I get a very, very bright value. And I also have an option for light visible. At the moment, my light is visible. I can see it. But I can press this button, and then my light will become invisible, but its value will still remain in the scene, and its illumination will continue to affect our scene. The last Arnold light type is the Sky Dome light, and this is the method we use for HDRI lighting setups, and we're going to be looking at this in a separate video.